Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, delighted to welcome you to our webinar uh, this afternoon, hosted by our partners at GovConnect. We'll be spending the next hour discussing the digitalization of wound care services. My name is Alec Mason. I'm the System Transformation Manager here at Smith & Nephew. I'm also a registered podiatrist and have extensive first-hand experience of working on the front line in the NHS, leading services and clinically specializing in wound management. I think my role at Smith & Nephew puts me in a, a privileged position that I can take my passion around wound management and experience of frontline NHS work and hopefully help deliver um, and bring real value to our NHS partners. It's fair to say it doesn't always include a digital element, although I think increasingly the solutions we do talk about are getting increasingly digital. And I think we've seen a huge change in the NHS in the last 12 months with regard to, to digital solutions. And we're really excited from our perspective to be involved in some um, that specifically relate to, to, to wound care. Uh, for context and for those in the audience perhaps not overly familiar with the world of wound care, the estimated annual cost the NHS in 2012-13 was £5.1 billion. More recent evidence shows it's actually risen now to £8.3 billion over five years to 2017-18, so clearly a, a huge burden in terms of, of cost. Correspondingly, 399% increase in community nurse visits and 164% increase in the number of GP visits due to wound-related issues, so seemingly uh, not necessarily moving in the right direction, sadly. The reasons obviously are multifaceted and very complex, and I think we'll, we'll cover some of that this afternoon. But it is really clear that digital solutions can help, I think, both on a day-to-day -day point of care level and perhaps I think one of the critical benefits of any uh, digital solution is its ability to provide data that we can uh, interrogate. There's a well-tested adage in the world of research that states what you can't improve, you, uh, what you don't measure. Um, to this end, this afternoon, we'll be discussing how uh, digital can have a positive impact on, on wound management to improve patient outcomes. To uh, look over our agenda, I'm delighted to say we're joined by Lisa Hollins, the Director of Innovation Delivery at NHSX this afternoon. Lisa's going to give us an overarching context of digital development across the NHS. I'm also delighted to say we're joined by Una Adderley and Anne Jacklin from the uh, National Wound Care Strategy Programme. The programme is commissioned by NHS ENI, and its mission statement is to implement a consistently high standard of wound care across England by reducing unnecessary variation, improving safety, and optimising patient experience and outcomes. And Una and Anne can hopefully give us some context of the strategy and again how it's looking to harness digital solutions in the world of wound care. Finally, I'll be covering a short session talking about some of the projects that we at Smith & Nephew are, are involved in. Some of these are aligned to uh, the National Wound Care Strategy Programme. Hope you'll have seen the chat function. Uh, we encourage you to actively post questions throughout the sessions. We won't be stopping during presentations or, or between speakers uh, to take questions, but we have reserved some time at the end for an overarching Q&A. So please do um, answer, your, answer your questions. I'm not sure if any of our speakers have put together uh, any polls, but there is a poll function. So if you do see a poll um, pop up, then please do engage and um, answer um, and, and answer any questions we pose to you. That'd be really good. So without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to Lisa Hollins from NHSX, who's going to kick off our session this afternoon. Lisa, I'll give you a visual cue because I think she's having a few uh, audio issues. Okay, thank you very much. And it's really great to be here. I'm Lisa Hines, I'm Director of Innovation at NHSX, and I came to NHSX having a long career um, in the NHS. And what I wanted to do was to um, move to an organisation that could support investment and, and strategy in terms of technology, because I've managed a lot of uh, services from acute to primary care to community care, um, and knew how difficult it was for frontline staff to deliver these services. It's getting more difficult as demand grows um, and to see where technology could help so really pleased to um, to uh, be um, here today um, so just um, saying I'm going to say a little bit about um, NHSX so NHSX um, is just over a year old and we wanted to join the teams from the Department of Health and Social Care and a variety of teams across um, NHS England and other partners um, to make sure we could have a national strategy to deal with some of the really thorny issues related to technology in the NHS. And, and you all as, as healthcare practitioners will know about those um, thorny issues in terms of the underlying architecture, the investment, how we can make sure um, that technology really improves clinical pathways and makes 
um, the time that is quite precious to our, our clinical teams um, uh, uh, as um, focused on patient care as possible rather than focused on, on admin care. So we've got a key role in making sure we link with some of the national bodies, um, the policy arm of the Department of Health and Social Care, so we can, we can uh, make sure technology delivers benefits to um, to um, uh, to clinical teams and, and to patients. So I'm going to say a little bit about um, what happened during COVID because we saw some really active changes. And then I'll, I'll say um, a few more comments about uh, about the future. And I know that Una is going to present after me and uh, be really interesting to, to hear from, from her. Um, but I'll really comment on some of the initiatives that I think will help um, in terms of wound care and the really complex community services that we deliver now within the uh, within our um, populations across the country. So, in terms of the the, the work that happened over COVID. Um, there was a huge amount of change. I think people have heard um, about the uh, um, the remote consultations and um, the, the telephone advice and the video conferencing um, that has been rolled out in secondary care, but also general practice. So we went from a few um, practices having video consultation and really ramped that up to 92%. And there was a few um, other things that really supported that. So um, online consultations um, uh, now sit at over eight. So those on online consultations are a better triaging service uh, where we're able to capture much better um, uh, information for patients and it enables us to triage the right member of the primary care community or the secondary care community. Um, we also rolled out one uh, 35,000 um, uh, different devices, some laptops and some um, PCs to make sure people could, could link into uh, uh, to their clinical teams and their clinical practice, some homes. We did that in a three, three weeks period rolling out um, MS teams to 1.3 million people within three weeks um, and the NHS app which we're hearing quite a lot about now because the, we're looking um, uh, at that as a you know, perhaps uh, to offer other um, opportunities for, for our citizens across the country um, but it went from a, um, tens of thousands to 1.6 million um, in about five weeks in terms of the adoption and is doubled um, since that time um, and some of the really kind of I suppose fiddly technical um, um, areas that we were able to support patients um, we had a 1.47 um, million isolation notes. So these are the little fit notes that we usually get in, in paper from our GP practices. Um, we um, uh, made sure there's an electronic way um, of, do, uh, of doing that. Certainly I used um, this service. Um, so we were, we were able to make sure we got those out to people together with, um, for those people who were shielding um, um, uh, during the pandemic, all those people who had had a positive test, um, all of those text messages um, to make sure people were, were safe and well at home. Um, and we've since developed some of the architecture and infrastructure for the vaccine um, program. So you can, you can all, everybody has a text now to, to be invited for their uh, vaccine appointment um, and it's really critical that we get that information in infrastructure right so we know from a public health point of view who's had their vaccine and who needs to be invited um, next so lots of um, uh, lots of areas um, that we hopefully made easier um, during um, some difficult times so I'm going to, to say more about some of the specific work that myself and my, my team did and um, which which relates to the work that Una is doing and colleagues are doing across the country in terms of delivering wound, wound care services. Um, so we've been really conscious that, um, um, that the communication between patients um, and staff um, uh, is often we, we want it to be a little bit more frequent at times, and um, is sometimes quite uh, quite difficult because we see staff every uh, uh, staff see patients every three months if they're on a on routine follow up, and if people are housebound, of course, um, they they're seen um, when the district nurse or the health professional goes to visit. So how can we um, support people in their their homes um, through remote monitoring and through the first wave of the pandemic, we saw a real plethora of devices that had been signed off by the MHRA um, and uh, we started to use. So we started to use pulse oximeters um, to um, see how they could be attached to a digital platform um, so people could be um, uh, 
monitored remotely by clinical teams. So it would attach them to a dashboard and they'd be alerting to the clinical teams if people were deteriorating. Uh, and that was a, a, a really good way of making sure when people were discharged or when people um, uh, exhibited uh, a low or medium risk of COVID within uh, within primary care, we could put people onto these pathways. So, so um, uh, although this was a new pathway for COVID, um, colleagues will know that actually this kind of type of remote monitoring for COPD or uh, for cardiovascular services, the heart failure services has been in operation. And indeed, Mersey Care, one of the community care trusts in the Northwest, uh, were doing some excellent work for the last 10 years on these areas. So um, this is a really big area of op opportunity for us. So we've heard some really good examples in, in, in um, heart failure, in COPD, and more recently within in um, uh, COVID pathway, but actually, um, this is a really these are really important initiatives for, for figuring out how we can care for patients in their own homes and make sure that vital signs um, for patients can be gained. Um, that we are really uh, it can help and support um, people when they're fine. That we don't need to, to go and visit them, or we don't um, need to bring them into a, to a clinic. Um, and we really focus our time on those um, patients that we know well. And we use those the, the apps and the, the alerting and the image sharing, which is particularly relevant for for wound care, um, to, to help utilise our um, our patients' time well. Um, our clinical team's time well and, and uh, um, that if people are deteriorating we, we know and we can intervene um, in a timely manner. So this means um, that um, pathways will be quite different in future. We're used to visit based um, pathways, perhaps some individual apps that all do slightly different things and quarterly monitoring of patients as very kind of site based care. But in the future um, if we have all of this information and, and um, that information is, is produced more readily and we can decide when uh, we want that to be available, whether we want it every day or whether we want it once a month or, or, or once a quarter, um, that actually puts a really different um, uh, type of pathway um, and enables us to link with other parts of the clinical team. So if those, if the dashboards and alerting can be seen by the district nurse, but also um, by um, the respiratory physician uh, in secondary care, actually um, the, the joint working um, um, lends itself to, to more opportunities than with than we have at the moment but the most important thing is that we 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 get um we enable people to be supported um within their daily lives so having them at home uh, whenever it's um, safe to do so but we have a greater wealth um, an opportunity of information to um to do that so just to say a few words about some of the plans over the next year. Um, remote monitoring is really suitable for the most vulnerable patients who um, usually have um, uh, kind of four or five long term conditions and we can support um, those uh, within their own homes. All of our regional health health um, authorities um, have a, a plan now for implementation of, of remote monitoring. We are extending that with, with working with the national clinical directors, looking at digital um, pathway transformation for some of those really tricky pathways. So heart failure, certainly respiratory disease, uh, linking in with them. Um, um, Andrew Menzies Gow, the national clinical director, and we're rolling out image um, sharing for ophthalmology um, and more image sharing pathways for dermatology and other services. So, so. Uh, lots um, happening over the next um, six to 12 months. Um, and one of my colleagues is doing um, a great deal of work linking uh, from uh, uh, the, a lot of uh, companies making sure that, that data can flow um, from one system to another. So it's really important that if data is collected um, on a device in somebody's home, that that needs to flow within the electronic patient records. And his job uh, is to make sure that that, that information is uh, transferred. Um, and then just the final slide, uh, really, before I hand over to uh, to colleagues, this is a, a uh, programme of work we've been doing, following on from lots of discussions we had with, with clinicians across the country who wanted us to help them with what um, uh, what systems and products are out there? Are there any any good? And which organisations have helped implement them? So we've done five. Um, we call them digital playbooks. Um, kind of sticks in people's uh, minds um, uh, in cardiac uh, services, in respiratory, ophthalmology, dermatology, and MSK. So we're looking at those high um, volume pathways. We're open to to um, um, suggestions for our, for our next um, uh, next playbook. Um, but we certainly will be in in April. We'll be uh, 
uh, we've started work on, on cancer um, services, gastroenterology and mental health um, as our next um, three areas. Um, and they really um, very quickly summarize um, what's out there, who's implemented it, and just place it along the digital pathway in a really um, easy way. And we had lots of feedback back, uh, back from national clinical directors who wanted to identify these are the key risks within clinical pathways. Let's do a really good summary of services around um, our um, uh, re rehabilitation, uh, pulmonary rehabilitation in a community, those kinds of things um, that we really wanted to make sure people knew about. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I will um, put the link to digital playbooks in the uh, uh, in the chat. Um, but um, uh, well, I'll be here um, for the next um, 15 minutes. So happy to any answer any questions in the chat while colleagues are speaking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. I'd like to hand over to Una Adley now from the National Wound Care Strategy Programme. Una. Hello. That seems to have gone surprisingly slickly. Whenever you do something on digitalisation, you just wait for it to go wrong. No, no offence to you, Lisa. It's just we really want to manage well with this. So um, I'm director of the National Wound Care Strategy Programme, and we have been extremely interested in um, everything digital, really, because we see it as the way forward. So what I'm going to talk about over the next 10 minutes or so is about what our plans are and how we're incorporating these ideas that Lisa's discussed into our work. Um, as Alec referred to, um, the National Care Strategy Programme was um, commissioned just over about two and a half years ago now, we're almost up to two and a half years. And it was in response to um, it, the desperate need to improve wound care. Our purpose is to focus on pressure ulcers, lower limb ulcers and surgical wounds. So we're not responsible for everything. But we see the need um, being to work with key partners such as NHSX and others, obviously, to establish um, the underlying case for change to identify what needs to change and to make it happen. So that's our role. As, as referred to, um, it's a really, really big problem. Um, the, the original work was um, initiated following the Burden of Wounds publication, which estimated um, that 4.5 to 5.1 billion was being spent on wound care. It's roughly equivalent to obesity, but without you know, without the publicity that it gets. I'm also talking about the same as cancer. There was a publication just before Christmas which suggests things got really quite a lot worse. Now, there are uncertainties around these figures because they are based on um, modelling data. But I think what everybody agrees is the problem is very big and it's getting bigger. Um, I'm told that it's about 35-40% um, of community nursing work and I'm told that it's crept up to a similar level in practice nursing. Now, I haven't got robust data for that, but that's what I'm being told from the ground. So we know we've got to do something about this. So why is it so bad? We know we've got a real problem with unwarranted variation. We know there is significant underuse of evidence-based care. Um, a lot of the work is to do with lower limb, and we know there is significant underuse of pressure therapy um, but endovenous ablation product, um, can, therapies which have a really good um, evidence base to support them but just aren't being used as they should and we also know there's the overuse of ineffective interventions we all need good quality dressings but um, at the moment the evidence that any particular dressing improves wound healing is um, just doesn't really doesn't exist and yet people if you speak to nurses doctors all they want to know is about dressings and we know the dressings are important they're good in quality but they're not what's actually going to heal the wound. so that's one of the first problems we've got poorly organized care I've, i speak to so many clinicians who know what they should be doing but they're working in an um, a system that doesn't allow them to do what they know needs to happen um, so we haven't got the pathways of care just, just the, things aren't joined up but we have the other thing that is major, which again, Alec referred to in the beginning, we have a lack of data and information to inform quality improvement. Um, if you don't measure it, it, you can't tell whether things are really getting better. And so we know that we've got to address data and information as an absolute essential if we're going to improve care. So positive data. Well, data is important for several different reasons. 
Um, obviously, um, we need data for business purposes. We, we need it to inform commissioning contract management. We need it for service management, business case development and force management. And of course, clinicians need it, a point of care for a continuity of care to help them make the right decisions. If you don't know what's gone on, if your patient's gone to hospital, they've had a consultation there, but you haven't got the data to tell you what's happened. It's very difficult to actually make an appropriate clinical decision when you that patient's in your care. Audit, um, obviously we need to constantly measure and we need to identify this unwarranted variation. And there's all sorts of different types of data you'll see on the left-hand side of this slide. There's all the stuff that relates to patients, their, their age, their gender, the demographics, um, who the, which services are involved, what's actually going on with their clinical condition. But also there's workforce data, which staff are involved, and also product data, what wound care products are being used and what equipment is being used. So, and at the moment this is, all over the place with data. If things are being written down, but we're not getting the information we need from the things being written down. And we use data at different levels. Now, obviously at the national level, we need highly aggregated patient workforce products. I mean, I would love to know how many patients there are with wounds. I can't give you that answer because we, we don't actually know at the moment. And then obviously if I would um, work as um, a commissioner within an integrated care system, I'd want to know what was happening within that care system. So, I, so commissioning could be appropriate, so we can measure what's happening at integrated care system level. As a local provider, I need to know what's going on. I need to be able to manage the contracts. And obviously as a clinician, of course you need that detailed data for continuity of care. As you can see with the arrow coming down on the left, the data needs, uh, there is increasing granularity of keeping it closer to the patient. But all these different areas, we all need data. Now, I've attempted to put a poll in here, and I've never used a poll before, so I'm hoping um, this will work, and I'm not quite sure how it does, but we'll, we'll have a go. Um, I think if I click on polls, I might be able to see. Right, so my first question was to the audience, do you handwrite clinical notes? Do you work with the paper system? So the moment it's telling me 100%, um, so I don't think I've got to give it time. Or do you work with a desk or computer? Where do you put your data in, your clinical data? Do you enter your clinical notes on a handheld device? And I'll just give people a bit of time to put their things in. What it's looking like, it's moving around. I don't know if you can see this if you click on the poll, but it looks roughly as there's a large number of people um, still relying on paper systems. There's about 40 to 50 percent have access to a laptop, and hardly anybody, seven percent, is using a hand. And our argument would be that we really need to change this so that as many, certainly if you're in a job which requires you to be mobile, such as out in the field, district nurse, need nursing services, that you will be able to use a tablet or phone so you can directly put your data in. Um, and I would hope that we don't use paper much longer because the trouble with paper is it's in class and people don't read it. We need that data to flow between the different services so we can all access what we need. So thank you for that. That's really interesting. It's probably the most robust data I've got on that topic so far. And I've been asking that question for a while. So thank you. Um, so I'm trying to get back to my slides. There we go. Am I back on my slides? I am. Right. So, in the programme, we have an underpinning principle that data collection must be secondary to operational practice. We all need data, but we cannot be doing extra data collection on top of our everyday work. So what we need is when we're putting information in that we need, that we don't then need to go and do an extra audit or whatever else is needed, that actually the data we put in can be pulled through to the other systems. That's what's needed, we believe. I put this up as an exemplar. Those of you who have an interest in lower limb wounds, anything that breaks down below um, the knee, will hopefully be aware that we've recently published, or say recently in the last six months, we've published both um, recommendations for what should happen, but also an implementation case for how, how this should happen, and a business case that has looked at the economics of this. If you haven't seen this yet, I do, and you've got any interest in this field, please go and have a look. It's on our website. I've given you the link now. Good news, we, um, we um, have estimated that actually implementing what we recommend, including costs, that for every pound invested, around £10 saving. So it's, if, you, if you're wanting to improve your services, please go and look at this document. Now, as expected, just at the top, of course we are recommending um, system change with how services are delivered. That's really, really important. 
But the second thing that really needs noting <clears throat> is that we're also recommending changes in how we deal with our data. And we are recommending the rollout of point of care, NHS compliant mobile digital technology to enable. And the costs of doing this have been incorporated into the business case. And these, these systems need to be capable of interfacing with the other essential NHS data systems. We think you cannot separate the good quality clinical care from the good quality data. The two have to go through, go together with this. And the way forward for this is digitalization. Now, you may also be aware, we've recently recruited what we're calling our first tranche implementation site. What we are doing is recruiting a site from what each of the NHS England regions to work with us to test out implementation of these, project, of these proposals. And we're going to be working with Kent Community um, Health NHS Trust in, in the southeast, Hull University um, and surrounding organisations within the northeast in Yorkshire, Manchester um, Foundation Trust within the Northwest and Wye Valley in the Midlands. These are a variety. You've got very, very big trusts like Manchester and a very small one like Wye Valley. We felt it was important to get a range of people because if we just if we just work with the biggies, people say, well, yes, of course they can do that in Manchester. But we want to explore digitalization in a smaller organization like Wye Valley as well to work out how to make this happen and how to move it forward. Now, all these organisations have agreed to explore the use of web and digital systems, often known as apps, as to support how to support wound care, improving wound care. They've also agreed to provide analyst and business intelligence resource to report on the performance across the local sector, and also to support evaluation post-project, because the bigger answer is not just to improve care in these trusts, but to come up with a blueprint for how we do national rollout. And if any of you work in organisations are interested in this and you happen to work in an organisation in the South West, London or East of England, we will be recruiting for those areas um, come the summer. And we have got resource to invest um, to help you make this happen. So I do hope that might be of interest to some of you. We've got other digital activity that we think is also important. We have on our website, we, have, we are maintaining a register of known suppliers of these wound management digital systems. Our job is not to recommend certain apps. We, that we don't see that's our job, but our job is to actually try and maintain a register of what we know is out there to make it easy for those of you who want to go and look into this to find the relevant organisations. But we also are developing a set of what might be loosely called standards to inform procurement of these systems. So that if, you, if your organisation wants to go out and um, contract with one of these organisations, you've actually got some guidance for what, what you might want to look at, what this system is capable of. And we hope to get this published in the next month or two. We're on this, I think we're on the final draft of that. We are very close to getting that sorted. And that will of course be posted on our website as well. We are promoting digital wound imaging as part of standard care. In wound care, digital imaging is probably the most important um, digitalized, um, I don't quite the right word for it is, but well, you know, we, the type of information we need. And what we need though is it's not just a case of being able to take an image, it's taking a good quality image and being able to upload it to the patient's record and share it as needed with other clinicians involved in that patient's care. So again, we've got um, a consultation, I can't remember if it's out at the moment or about to go out on digital imaging, and we are listening to you and we want to know what you think to make sure that our recommendations actually are fit for purpose. We're also extremely interested in telemedicine for wound care. We have um, discovered the hard way that actually trying to get a patient to use their phone to show you the wound on their leg, with they probably they've got a bit of a tremor or they're a bit wobbly, is not the best way of actually doing telemedicine for wound care. But being able to have a static image and have a conversation with a patient can work extremely well. And interestingly, I know there's work going on in certain parts of the country, and one that's caught my attention is up in um, Wakefield, where they set up a, a new service in the middle of um, COVID. And they are having patients in, giving them a two-hour assessment. And then these patients, most of whom are going home to self-care with support, um, as needed and most the support for most of these patients i think off the top of my head about 75 percent or thereabouts are managing to self-care or help or care for their own wounds with help from a carer and just accessing a registered clinician support on about a monthly basis 
their patient satisfaction figures are through the roof. Their patients love it. And the, the reduction in impact on um, clinicians is remarkable and their healing rates are off the charts. So this is a success on every single level and it's being enabled by the support of digitalization as well. So they haven't managed to digitalize their notes next and that's their next challenge. The other things we're doing is we've moved to producing online education, which is um, free to access by anybody who wants it on our website. Again, we've got three new modules up there. And these are the first three of a suite of online learning modules. There won't be enough on their own, but I mean, I used to teach um, undergraduate and postgraduate students about wound care. I would have loved to have had something like this to be able to send the, the students to and say, right, go and do this online module and then come back to the classroom or however we're delivering education mode and we'll discuss it, apply to some case studies. So we're hoping this, in, this education, these learning resources won't just be used in isolation, but will be used as a building block for other educational um, interaction. And I just wanted to end with this slide. Somebody sent me back to the handbook for the NHS Constitution the other day, and I got a bit sort of um, animated and flag waving because I realised these are all things that we should be doing. We sh it says we have a pledge that the NHS commits to provide convenient, easy access to services within the waiting times. Digitalisation has to be the way forward to enable us to do it. You have the right to be treated by someone um, who is appropriately qualified and experienced. We need to make sure we put the education in. And again, digitalization offers us the opportunity to make sure they can do this. And then it pledges, there's also a pledge to ensure that everyone in your care and treatment has access to your health information. Again, digitalization has to be the way forward for this. This is the only way we're going to be able to move forward to deal with the volume of um, care that is, that is presented to us and to improve the quality of what we do by having accurate data and information. Thank you. So if I pass the baton back to Alec. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Una, for that. Just load up my slides now. Brilliant. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so as I mentioned in um, my introduction, I'd just like to um, just talk about some of the digital projects that we're uh, currently involved in um, and some of that align to the National Wound Care Strategy that, that Una has just been uh, talking about. And also probably a little bit of repetition again from um, Una's slides, um, but I think it is important we underline the impact of uh, chronic wounds, particularly on, uh, on, on, on wound care in terms of a burden in terms of patient outcome and both financial cost. Um, and the, the figures are quite, you know, staggering uh, 5.1 billion. And we know that that's uh, slightly out of date, out of date figure. We know it's moving in, uh, in the wrong direction. In terms of prevalence of wounds, we're seeing an increase in prevalence in, in acute wounds of 9%, uh, an increase in the prevalence of um, chronic wounds by 12%. A chronic wound, obviously, a wound that's not moving through the normal phases in the in the assumed manner, um, often stuck in the inflammatory phase without getting too bogged down in uh, in the physio physiology of wound healing. And obviously, stands to reason the more chronic a wound becomes, um, as well as a patient outcome decreasing, corresponding financial cost increases. Um, and we know that an unhealed wound uh, costs 135% uh, more than than a healed wound. So clearly, clearly some gaps um, in, in a poor patient outcome and an associated spiraling, uh, spiraling cost. In terms of clinical practice, obviously, there's been quite a few different studies. So again, in, in, in the same guest study around um, uh, documentation, um, so 30 percent of, of wound records um, that that study looked at contained no differential uh, diagnosis. Um, so again, it could perhaps highlight an issue that um, the assessment's not necessarily being recorded. Is it, is it being done and the systems are used to, to kind of help support that? In terms of assessment, again, in the same study, um, so one of the sort of key tenets of managing a lower limb ulcer is an arterial or vascular assessment. 84 patients had no record of a, an ankle break or pressure index, which is a, a well-regarded method of, of that type of assessment. And of that 84% in terms of treatment, 46% um, of, of patients being treated with um, with compression, which again, um, normally you'd want to satisfy yourself of, of the arterial supply before, before applying um, compression. In a separate study in terms of um, more like product selection, linking back to assessment and Xena Moore's study, 
and highlighted again that perhaps um, dressings being selected and not necessarily relating back to to an assessment so an example of that being 42 patients uh, 40 percent rather patients rec recorded who didn't have a, a wound infection being treated with uh, antimicrobial dressing and obviously these types of dressings typically have a higher unit cost than where they're used um, inappropriately um, that's obviously going to add to to a burden of cost so again, a sort of, I think between the two, um, lots of, of, of data that are there, it just shows a kind of deficiency around wound assessment. Again, how it's um, impacting potentially on patient outcome and certainly increasing, uh, increasing cost. So how can how can digital help? I mentioned that we're involved in um, some exciting projects, and I wanted to talk about a couple of the projects that, that from a digital perspective that we're that we're currently engaged in we've we've just launched a really exciting collaborative uh, pilot project with um, US company eCare um, which is on the list of the of the, the approved um, the approved programs on the, the national wound care strategy that Luna's just been talking about um, so it does support support that uh, program we're really really delighted to say that actually we're supporting one of the first tranche pilot sites again uh, with this technology that um, that Luna's just been uh, that's been outlining so what does the technology aim to do so kind of top line aims to standardize that wound assessment and management and, and reduce the unwarranted variation that, uh, that that we know is is there there's the potential as well through the system. Um, you know, again, I've just been talking about telehealth and, and remote patient monitoring, and there's um, there's mechanism within, within this solution to be able to to facilitate that um, in terms of in terms of efficiency. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in in a couple of slides time. And we've talked about data as well. The importance of um, of data in this system um, is fantastic in terms of being able to collect um, both raw data and a means of a dashboard for, for clinicians to be able to um, to be able to see exactly what's happening at, at a service level. A little bit more detail about what the solution um, is. So, Insight, so EK is the company. Insight is the uh, Insight is the solution. So. It's precise camera technology. It uses artificial intelligence and machine learning. Essentially, it can transform any tablet or smartphone device into a digital wound management platform. So on the um, iPad version uh, with a 3D sensor, the technology can essentially record the precise wound size. So it can take a uh, width and depth measurement and therefore uh, calculate uh, volume. So it automates one of the key areas of wound assessment that is um, unfortunately prone to subjectivity when, when a human's measuring a, measuring a wound assessment. Obviously, we can't get that element standardized. It's really hard to measure um, the trajectory of a wound. Is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? Is it stalled? So the, one of the key sort of point of care aspects of this technology is that it can provide the clinician um, with that ability to, to, to automate that, um, that, that process. As well as being available on, um, on an iPad, which you'd use in a clinic, it's also available on a smartphone. So again, in the hands of a community nurse, for example, <clears throat> using out and about in the, in the community. The wound images um, are captured in the system in a standardized way and pre present a really nice cumulative trajectory of, of, of the wound um, the wound healing so the clinician can see exactly what um, what trajectory the wound the wound is on the information is all stored uh, in a secure cloud it's HIPAA and GDPR compliant so it meets the different information governance stipulations that the NHS um, uh, normally ask for and the data is collected as I say it's a built-in reporting suite um, where it can produce those those automatic graphs so if somebody is not necessarily proficient with looking at, at big data sets and, and uh, playing with raw um, Excel data they can use a dashboard to be able to um, to be able to, to see exactly what's going on in, in their service I think I mean, one of the really exciting um, elements of this solution as well is its ability to, to harness telehealth and remote patient monitoring and obviously I think um, even though we've only launched the project in, in the last couple of months, certainly through the through the COVID pandemic, there has been a big shift, I think, in wound care towards um, towards the shared care um, way of working. And I think it's good to have a, a solution that that obviously can, can help um, can help support that. And just to kind of give a little bit more detail around how this particular solution works. So I think what's really interesting is a patient version of of the same app. So in terms of the giving the patient ownership, the patient can download a streamlined version of, uh, of the app. The clinician can basically then set reminders for the patient to be able to uh, take images of their wound, obviously where the patient has capacity um, and where shared care is, is, uh, is in place. 
they can have that reminder they can take image um, that's autom automatically measured and shared back to back to the clinician so whether the patient's shielding or the patient can't get to the clinic or um, again for the efficiency of the clinician not going to see see the patient um, but that information can be shared uh, shared backwards and forwards and I think that's a um, moving forward interesting to see um, how you know whether that can be sort of locked in post uh, post COVID as hopefully as we we come out of uh, can move out of the pandemic in terms of the um, <clears throat> the data really to kind of summarize, I think, um, so it gives the clinician at that point of care that, that view of the whole episode of care, which I think that relating back to my clinical practice, which uh, sadly was using uh, written paper records, it was often really hard to see um, what trajectory a wound was was on. And I think having that clear visual of seeing uh, where a, a wound is, is moving, it allows you clinically to be able to make an informed decision then about what you need to do with regard to, to management at, at a point of care level. Um, so, you know, this, this technology gives, gives the ability to do that. I think separately as well, we talked about the, the importance of data um, and a, a big believer in, in using and harnessing data to, to be able to make change. I think it's, it's, it's vital, that, uh, vital that we're able to do that. And this information, this um, solution can provide uh, really, really valuable and rich, uh, a rich data source, both in a, a in a means that the clinician can interpret for themselves through a dashboard, but also um, at a uh, at a service lead level, um, where we can basically look at the data and, and use it to to allocate resource potentially, look for patterns, um, and look for uh, you know any sort of evidence of any implementation of a pathway, what effect has it had on um, on a clinical outcome. In terms of the efficiencies to be gained through uh, through telehealth and, and uh, remote patient monitoring, again, I think it's a really important facet. Allow sharing of care. I think as we move into a certainly more integrated um, agenda in the NHS, um, uh, looking at some of the more recent consultation documents, I think having a solution that supports that um, that shared care um, as the NHS becomes uh, you know, less siloed moving forward is also is also a, a really useful uh, useful adjunct. And finally, that, that ability to involve the patient in their care, I think, is I think the, sh the shared care thing is is very very interesting. Um, and again, relate back to my clinical practice, I think it's 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 vital if we can give patient the patient ownership and an engagement um, in in their management. And I think having this patient app solution is a is a, a great means of of doing that. In terms of um, our support and project with uh, eCare, as I mentioned, we're um, supporting a number of sites um, across the UK. Um, we're still looking to recruit some sites, so I will share my email address at the end of my presentation if um, you're currently working in a, a wound service and you'd like to be involved in the work that we're doing with eCare, then please do, uh, please do get in touch with me. I think one of our strengths um, from a Smith Nephew perspective is ability to, to look at data and interrogate data um, and uh, you know report back on that in terms of the health economic support that, that we can provide. And we're also interested to see the impact of some of our pathways, products and solutions as well and use the technology to be able to, to see um, and measure the beneficial impact of, of, of those solutions. So as I say, by all means do please uh, please please reach out. Um, we'd be interested to, to hear from you and if we can support you in any way way separately and and away from um uh, more sort of clinical assessment in terms of a slightly different um solution uh, one of the other projects that we've been working on quite extensively in the last um, couple of years is another digital platform called formio um, as i say it comes away from the uh, clinical assessment side of things this is more about supply chain management at its core i think though we probably used to refer to this system as a direct supply type system However, the work that we've done and the way we've, we've evolved the system, I think it's become um, a lot more than that. Hence, you know, we do uh, refer to it as a, a digital wound management system, even though it's not necessarily to do with, uh, with the clinical assessment side of things. Um, and I'll cover a little bit more about sort of how we've how we've evolved the system in the last in the last couple of years. But just to kind of give a bit of context about um, why the system um, can can be of benefit. Prescription in the UK is still by far the most common means of, of clinicians accessing um, dressings for, for their patients. Um, however, we know the vast majority of products aren't prescription only medicines, so it doesn't need to be that products need to come through, uh, through, through this route. There are a couple of uh, key issues with uh, prescription. 
with wound care, firstly, um, the delay in, in, in the clinician getting the product. Obviously, if you're a clinician and assessing a patient for, for a first time and you haven't got access to the correct product, it presents you with a, with a dilemma about applying a suboptimal product. And if you do that, what's it going to mean cl uh, clinically for, for the trajectory of the wound? We've been conducting a lot of survey work around um, this process. Um, over the last six months, and uh, to date, um, we've we've got a 4.5 day uh, delay average at the, at the moment. Clinicians are saying it's taking to, to get hold of a product via, via the prescription route, and obviously that's potentially going to have a, going to have a, a negative impact. The next sort of key issue with the, this uh, route is is wastage, and again, personal experience of in my in my clinical uh, role previously seeing patients in the community walking into a patient's home and you find boxes of dressings um, packed away in a room because dressings are mostly prescribed uh, by by the box and it just means that there's there's unfortunately a significant level of waste um, a reference to be 35 percent um, via uh, via this route so it's not necessarily an optimal way of of um, providing um, providing dressings as I mentioned, we've done some survey work and just to kind of give a, a bit more feedback on some of the other elements that we've, um, some of the other questions that we've kind of posed as part of that. We were just quite keen to find out that delay, does it have any type of uh, impact? Um, and quite a staggering statistic, 75% of, of nurses that we've surveyed report that not having access to the right product uh, at the point of care has ne negatively impacted um, on patient outcomes, which for a problem that's seemingly um, relatively easily easily solved is a, is a staggering a staggering statistic. In terms of um, sort of use of, of clinical time as well, the other other kind of key issue is the amount of clinical time spent um, chasing for a, a, an administrative process, essentially a two and a half, uh, sorry, 2.7 hours uh, per clinician each week um, chasing prescriptions for dressing. So again, collectively across the whole service amounts to, uh, to a significant proportion of, um, of time. When we sort of talked about the uh, negative impact and the, the impact on clinicians, again, 71% um, nurses saying increased visits as a result of not having the correct dressing at the first um, at the first visit, so they're having to kind of play catch up essentially um, to, to 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 make amends for not having the the appropriate dressing at at, at the point of care. So to say, it, it, I think unfortunately, it just it just it demonstrates that as a as a process, perhaps not not ideal for for sort of an optimal wound management. So how can Formio help? Let's say it's essentially a shift away from FP10 to a stock management based system. So essentially it means that as a clinician they've got immediate access to, to optimal products that ma marry up to uh, their local wound, wound care formulary. So immediately it takes away the issue of any, any negative effect of not having the right product um, at, at the point of care. Also, as the dressings now are not prescribed, whereas if they're prescribed, they leg legally belong to uh, to a patient and can't be transferred to somebody else. Through this system, they belong to um, to the, the paying organisation, be that uh, CCG or, or um, provider organisation. So the boxes can be split um, and it used as as per necessary. So it, it reduces and takes away the, the burden of uh, uh, product waste. We've also built complete flexibility around supply uh, routes within the system as well. So there's different frameworks that can be accessed um, in terms of kind of preferential pricing for, for, for different products. We just recently partnered with a specialist compression um, supplier day long as well and built that into, into the portal um, to be able to, to offer because there's lots of separate issues um, around prescription of compression products. And again, we've built that solution into, uh, into this system. And we're, con we're constantly evolving the system. I think yes, the, the, the roadmap that we've got for it is, uh, is really, really exciting kind of moving forward. But those are the kind of key, the key um, benefits, I'd say. And uh, hopefully you can see that, that uh, they seem to address a lot of the issues that are associated with, um, with prescription. I mentioned as well that the, um, we've evolved the system, I think, to, to be more than just a, a product ordering system. I think the first thing to say is, is again, round to, to, to that data point we talked about for um, wound assessment, and the same level of data is, is vital in, um, in accessing uh, what products, the products are being used, when and, and, and where, and in what kind of quantity. Unfortunately, again, with prescription, you know, the EPAC data generally lags by a couple of months, 
Um, so we see it kind of retrospectively, and it's often quite hard to 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 trace and see exactly where we know where the prescription has been generated from normally um, from a GP practice. We don't know who's requested the prescription though, unless it's actually come from um, from a non-medical prescriber, uh, for example. But we can't necessarily trace that. With the Formio system, we can uh, get real-time uh, live data uh, sets. And similar to, to Insight, I talked about the dashboard. So we, we have a, um, a plug-in now for a dashboard on the Formio system that gives a clinician um, really, if they're not familiar and not au fait with using uh, spreadsheets, they're able to, um, they're able to utilize and manipulate a simple dashboard so they can see on a service level and then we can obviously take a greater data set and build more bespoke and specific reports for um, for services as as needed separately we've built an education portal into the system as well and again i think it, this makes it a much more sort of rounded system so we can add any other type of clinical pathway and obviously the the um the clinical specialist at the the uh, service we're working with have complete ownership of, of, of what they populate um, in terms of education material um, on, onto, onto there. So as I say, it becomes something that's way more than, than uh, a product ordering uh, a product ordering system. And that's pretty much my slides done. As I said, please, if my share my email address if you are interested in um, the uh, being involved in perhaps any, any of the pilot sites want any further information around the formula system as i say then please uh, please feel free to um to to drop me an email so i shall stop pre presenting um my slides there one second the pressure of managing a digital event and being able to juggle different digital solutions ah luna's back that's good to see and Anne as well that's reassuring <laughs> everyone is still here and we've got a few minutes i think we've got nine minutes up to the hour at two o'clock um i have been i've co-opted a colleague of mine to collate a couple of questions for me which i shall just one second And this is a question, I think, for Una. So why, if these studies have these outcomes, what more is needed to implement changes in clinical practice? Yeah, it's a really good question. That. I find it staggering that we can present um, senior people with a business case that's agreed by their own financial team to bring so many benefits to so many and such savings, and yet are told it's not a priority yet. But that's the world we live in. Um, having said that, um, we certainly weren't turned away. There is a great deal, I can assure you, there is a great deal in, of interest in our work at very, very senior levels in NHS England and the Department of Health. So even though things sometimes appear to be moving slowly, they're moving a damn sight faster than they have been for the last 20 years. So there is progress. I agree with you, it's painfully slow. Trust me, I feel that pain as well, as Anne knows, because I chunted to her. But we're chuntering this morning, weren't we? But there you go. <laughs> I do feel the pain. The problem is, ironically, it comes back to data. If you haven't got data, it's very difficult to make the argument. Now, we have got some data. We didn't have data. We have got some data now. We've got some fairly reliable data, and it is catching attention. We need better data. Um, but you always end up with this catch-22. You haven't got data. You haven't got the investment to get the data. Therefore, you can't get the data. Plus the fact um, this is primarily a community issue. And as we all know, community is the poor relation within the NHS. I don't think I've ever seen anybody on a march to do something about the appalling reduction in um, district nursing services, even though everybody watches Call the Midwife, so explain that one to me, please. But you see people on marches for local hospitals, you don't see them for their, save the local district nurse. So I think it's a combination of factors. But what I would say is we are starting to get data. Um, Anne has a mantra that we are going to do this right rather than doing it fast. We'd prefer to do both, but it's more important. The priority is to get it right rather than just rush at something and get it wrong again, because that's happened too often. We are definitely getting traction. Things are moving. I'm sorry it's so slow, but trust me, we're doing our best. So I think we will see move. The fact, I mean, the really encouraging fact is the National Income Strategy started off with a budget of, I think it was just over 200,000 a year. Um, and which just was about enough to fund about 
two people by the time we put all the on costs and everything else in. So we've, you know, we've done a huge amount in two years with a load of people just volunteering. We've now got long term funding and we've been promised that for five years. So now we can start to actually get motoring. We've been interviewing over the last couple of months. We are getting things moving, but it's 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 tough. It's really tough. Yeah. Is that fair enough, Anne? I don't know if you want to add to that. <laughs> Uh, I'd agree. I think it's it's a really complex to get this right, and we don't provide enough support at the moment to frontline staff to have the evidence available at the point of care and to support them to do the better job with the best evidence in the right place. And that's what we want to try and address. Brilliant. Thank you, Anne. Um, next question was around adoption of the, um, this sort of thing una forgive me i think you may have you may have potentially answered this in the uh, i've just seen in the in the mm -hmm. chat box um but it's around adoption of this type of technology so i think there was a, it's a, a two-part question really i think is around you talked about i think patients not being able to cope with potentially with telehealth solutions right. being, perhaps being a little complex um mm -hmm. can, I, can i take that one because there are yeah, please questions do. about the, the technology so Will the technology interact with um, or integrate with your current um, electronic patient records? Um, not all of them can now. All of them need to have the ability to, and we're working with not, uh, we know all the suppliers are working actively with the suppliers of the systems. We're also working with NHS Digital and NHS X to make sure that we get the national support that we need to make sure that they're fully integratable across the system. So I think the answer to do they integrate with um, Rio, System One, EMIS, blah, blah, not all of them do now, but for them to actually work and be useful, they all will and they all have the function functionality. The standards we're setting are for, um, for either healthcare professionals or for patients to be able to enter information and do the work so they'll be completely flexible. What hasn't been asked is which sector are we looking at? We're looking at applicability for primary community and secondary care because we know wounds are a pathway issue and so we need the technology that covers all ends of the pathway so we are looking at all sectors so we need integration we need to work with um, EPR they all need to actually work with a phone a tablet or a laptop or a PC so you can use them in your clinics or mobile again across the pathway all of them are in different stages of development all of the people developing these things are working really closely with the national program and we're having an iterative process that everything that's being built and we've heard a lot about it, uh, insight this afternoon we've been working together for now nearly two years i think with the companies 18 months with the companies so we take we say what you we want you tell us what you're making we agree this is all what we want and you say yes that sounds very reasonable so that actually we're not working in isolation from the NHS and the people developing products so that the standards that we'll develop and publish have been developed in partnership with everybody that's introducing an app. Will we be recommending one app? No, there are lots of healthcare providers, there's a really big market, we just want people to have and, and just to say we're not only talking about an app, all of the products we're looking at have an, a, a digital imaging, assessment collection, blah, 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 front end that could be mobile on a clinic or on a ward, but also have some analytical capability so that you're not relying on the capability of your current EPR to analyze your data, but they'll all link with your EPR so the data will flow into your local and national data sets. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, Anne. I think I think on on the, on that I think it's what's interesting, and I think um, Una, it links back to the question you posed in the poll. I think interesting to see that the relatively high proportion of people that responded to say they're still using um, handwritten paper mm. records. Mm. I think, and I think it. Whilst I think absolutely the integration element is is key, um, and, and obviously having all these apps and, and solutions that can talk to one another, and, and let's face it, there's a lot of different EPR systems um, out there that use um, in the in the NHS at the moment. Um, but I think it shows that people have very very different starting points. There's a lot of clinicians out there that are still using that are still using mm -hmm. paper records. It's not necessarily we're not we're not integrating with anything there. We're starting from from uh, from, from scratch. <laughs> 
Can I just add there, though, that also um, we're not only working with ourselves in NHS X and digital, but we're also working very directly with NHS E and I in both the nursing directorate with the um, the nurse director in charge of community, but also with the community and ageing well directorate where we've got the national director for community and ageing well and and they have a digital strategy team so we're integrating with that digital strategy team so that we align the work we're doing with national policy at digital at x at e and i and with the suppliers so that we're all beginning to talk the same language and if i could just take the floor jill are we only targeting england we are because we're nhs mm -hmm. england funded um is what we're doing applicable in england uh, scotland and wales yes and the website and all of our materials we're sharing and we know that some bits of scotland and wales will be slightly ahead and some will be fast followers but it's you know the funding is what it is um but um everything's applicable and shared yeah thank you for that i was wanting to say the same and in fact i have a meeting next week call next week with the Scottish, Irish and Welsh nurses, so no doubt this will come up then. We do talk to each other. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, we're just clicking on to two o'clock now, so I think we've reached the uh, the end of our, our session. Um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to, to Lisa Hollins. I think she's had to to leave the session um, for, for a, a really informative session. Thank you, Una, uh, for a brilliant presentation. And thank you, Anne, as well, for your for your input. Um, I hope everybody's enjoyed the, the session. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.